I'm going to shift uh, topics um, because I've brought the first caller into the uh, into the chat, and I think that his point probably relates to what we were discussing last week, and in particular some of the comments that Michael um, was making. I know that Michael does have to leave fairly shortly, so I want to bring him in now. Concordance will probably come back to that. I don't mean to be disrespectful by uh, uh, changing topics so quickly. Uh, ADT, are you with us? Uh, yes. Hi, we can hear you well. What have you got for us? I'd like to talk about objective morality. Good. One of my favourite topics. Go on. The floor is yours. Okay, well, after watching a bit of William Lane Craig and hearing some of the discussions around this, um, I wasn't really convinced about the definition of objective morality that's going around. It, it seems that people believe that there is some sort of single... I'm not, I'm not relating to this absolutism or anything, but it seems that people believe there is a single... Uh, sources objective morality such as uh, something out of the universe and i believe there's another definition using it the uh because i actually look I, I couldn't find any real solid definition so i actually looked up the two words objectivity and morality and i sort of came up with my own definition which i believe is a lot more practical um Do you i believe to that, no sure um i believe that an objective morality can be defined as a system that determines good from bad in a mind independent fashion okay that means nothing to me um let me let me just um explain certainly the the position so far as william lane craig is concerned that he his position does definitely appear to be that he believes that objective morals and objective moral, moral values are somehow woven into the fabric of the universe I, and I, I simply don't do not understand that definition Having only read a few pages of um, Sam Harris, it is clear that he is using a different definition of objective. So I am, I, I am totally with you. There is a um, there is a confusion about what definition is being used. But as concordance, as you probably see, is it's typing in the chat. How can even with your definition, how can a value be mind independent? Does it mean? Does it have any meaning? To say that there are moral values if there are not minds to make that judgment. I'll let you answer and then I will go to concordance. Um, well, let me elaborate a little bit more. Um, sure. One of the advantages of this definition is that it allows for multiple objective moralities, and objective mor moralities don't exactly need to be. How universal. can you have multiple objective moralities? Well, it simply it simply means they're mind independent. You can have you can have multiple mind independent systems. I'm not following that concordance. Um, so suppose we have a universe entirely filled with rocks, inanimate, no minds. Uh, what what is the objective moral in our universe full of rocks and nothing but rocks? You, you wouldn't have one. Um, well, you could have one, but it wouldn't really have much purpose. Okay. Well, so when, when you say, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I need to come back on you. When you say you could have one, how could you have one? Well, what, what, one what form would this objective moral or moral value take? Thou shalt not rock another rock. Thou shalt um, not be unlucky. I'll try and give an example. A very quick example is you could say the uh, legal system could be some sort of objective moral. It's mind independent. There's something, someone's written it, of course, it's but not, there's something. It's not mind of... independent. It's a structure of society. It's entirely mind dependent. So, uh, on what objective basis, let's say, is theft? On what objective basis is theft in a mind independent matter immoral? If it is. May I jump wow. in? I, because I think, I think actually, um, our, our guest has got it right. I think he's closer to being right about what objective actually means than many people I've seen on this show or even Including some philosophers. Me, like as I'm a ph philosophical illiterate. I don't mind. Please explain, <laughs> Michael, if you can, as best you okay. can. Okay. So, well, I'll, I'll take up Concordance's challenge. Um, a, a moral um, truth could be just that suffering is bad. Um, and that could be true whether suffering exists in the world or not. It would be a 
like even in your universe full of rocks, suffering is bad whether anyone's suffering or not. Um, it's not dependent on there being suffering in order for it to be categorized as being, being a bad thing. And I've said that actually, that, that exact phrase, that if, if we clearly define what we mean by moral, if, if we say our goal is, but by imp you, you've smuggled it in, Michael, you've smuggled in our, our mind, you've smuggled in the mind that says that objective is wrong, therefore it is morally correct that, that you know, or, or objectively correct that anything which increases suffering is immoral. But you've already smuggled in your own, uh, your own judgment, your own mind, your own value statement. Well, I your to, value I statement was that suffering is wrong. Wait, wait, wait. What, Sorry, what I thought, if I thought had, you finished. Do carry on. What, what if we have a group of robots, uh, mindless robots? They, they act ac according to certain laws. Is there anything which they can do to each other? And we're, we're trying to divorce ourselves from any kind of imposition of minds. It's, it's a universe of robots. The robots act on each other in various ways. There, there's no morality, I would say, inherent in that because there's no one to make any judgments about the outcomes of actions one way or the other. Correct? You, you, you can't well, I mean, I think your just mind. One, sec one second, please. There. I think it's only fair that we go back to Michael, but I know uh, I have the benefit of seeing the chat in our Skype conversation. Um, ADT, ADT does want to expand on his definition. So firstly, Michael, to respond to concordance, and then we'll come back to you, ADT. The reason why robots wouldn't uh, be categorized as under your scenario uh, for moral actors is simply because they cannot apprehend suffering. It has nothing to do with whether suffering is bad itself. To maintain the idea that suffering is, is not morally relevant at all, you'd have to actually, your burden in this case, would be to explain to me why genuine suffering could be perceived in any rational way as being either good or morally neutral. Michael, I've got to pick you up on this because I, I'm sorry, we will come back to you, ADT. I'm, I'm not getting uh, what, you're, what you're saying because taking concordances, uh, example, of a universe containing only rocks, suffering would have no meaning, would it? Well, it, it, existentially, it would have no meaning. Like there wouldn't be any suffering happening in that world. But that wouldn't mean that uh, suffering isn't bad. It would be the same thing as if there were one atom in a universe or an empty universe. Just because there's only one atom doesn't mean that there's no such thing as the number two or that two minus one is one or any other mathematical truths. So I, I think what happens in these cases are people conflate truth value with being existentially like present and that's that's a problem because truth is a function of statements rather than of things i think i understand but um i i was again looking at perhaps from a more um, practical or physical point of view i mean the the moral value um it couldn't take any physical form it's not um woven into the fabric under, under that floating scenario, in the ether. Yeah. This is what I mean when I when I say it's got no meaning unless there is a human. I've had I've kept ADT waiting too long. Let's go back to him because I think he wants to expand on his definition. Back to you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring up another example because I please believe it better explains it. Uh, evolution morality. Um, I mean that's something I believe in. How morals are brought through through evolution because if we killed each other then we wouldn't exist. Isn't that a mind independent process? That's something we don't decide. That's something that we don't decide directly. So you could call something like that an objective morality because it defines what's good or bad instinctually. And that would be, uh, that would apply to the set of humans. Maybe some species of humans, some different races of humans would be different to others, but you could apply that sort of objective morality to that set. And that would be mind independent and it would be determining what is good or bad. I'm, I'm not comfortable with it. I'm not entirely right, sure let, why. Let me, I think it probably because it's that the example you've just given is so uh, necessary on on 
humans and human minds, but concordance is undoubtedly going to express it much better than I am. Concordance. Well, I, I think you're doing the you're you're performing the same trick that Michael is. I I personally think, uh, in that you're smuggling in a conclusion. So you're saying that our continued survival is an a morally good thing. You've set an agenda, and that is it. It is important to you as a mind that humans continue to exist or a, a species continues to exist. And therefore, anything that violates that principle, the thing that you've decided is the high moral, is therefore objectively immoral. But of course, it's subjectively objective. That is, you've decided what the outcome that is desirable is. You've set up a set of rules subjectively. And then you've come up with ways to prove that objectively uh, you can evaluate each action. And I think that you've smuggled in the subjectivity in the same way that I think Michael is smuggling in the idea that, say, suffering is bad. Well, suffering is bad to Michael, right? And we can say there are no animals we know of that are, are happy about suffering, right? But again, it's, it's a matter of the mind needing to uh, decide on a criteria. Michael, suffering is subjective okay so um under that definition of uh, under that burden of proof then objectivity just doesn't exist at all thank you we agree okay see you michael so, <laughs> <laughs> no go on carry on no no i so, mean let's, let's look at things like, that are objective michael things like mass okay. and height and weight these are things that are inherent in the object things that are inherent in the object irregardless and not irregardless regardless of who is perceiving them they have a property does that make sense so that we don't we don't have to we don't have to impose any judgments we don't have to make any decisions which are things inherent in the subject in the subject object dichotomy well no if you if you just define objectivity as categorically excluding any judgments then, well, your, your arguments are true. Well, that's the definition of the term. No, it's that it's mind independent. So how do you make judgments without a mind? No, it's that it doesn't, um, it, it's mind independent in the sense that no one needs to be suffering in order for suffering to be, to be wrong. No, we're saying no one needs to. No one needs to decide whether suffering is wrong for suffering to be objectively wrong. In other words, it is in and okay, of itself. So suffering in and of is itself it, is a bad thing. Is it with, with, without any judgments that, about what our goal is? No, uh, suffering being bad would, I think, under your under the language you're using, be a. So can we think of a, a scenario, can we imagine even a scenario where, where suffering, genuine suffering, would be a, a good thing? Or are we going to include, you know, greater goals? Things like, you know, making someone suffer enough to stop well, them? If, think, yeah, if, greater? if you're including scenarios where we have some suffering in order to create much less suffering in the future, well, then you're still appealing to the notion that suffering is bad and that we want to minimize it. But isn't that judgment as to what suffering is subjective? Sorry, how? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm not saying... Suffering itself can be an objective property, right? Whether or not something is suffering is probably something that we could measure objectively. The question is, at mm -hmm. what point does suffering... Do, do we need to make a judgment that suffering by itself is either good or bad. And I, I, I'll tell you the okay. truth, Mike, I don't, think it's even a, I don't think it's even logically coherent to think that there would be an objective value, right? If there's a value being made, I'm sorry, a value uh, judgment being made, then there's no way that a mind-independent source uh, could allow for those, that to happen. There's, there's no way for, without, in the absence of humans, for an opinion to happen, right? You can't have an objective opinion. And that's what I think we're kind of getting to is that morals are in their own way a value statement and minds are conditional. Uh, we, we require minds for values to have any meaning. Well, but then that would also be true about mathematical truths, um, about logical truths as well. 
like they they're apprehended by minds, but that doesn't mean that they're subjective. They're not dependent, they are apprehended by minds, but it's not dependent on the apprehension of the mind in order for it to be true or false. Right, because two rocks in our, our universe, one plus one rock equals two rocks, right? But that's an yeah. observation, that's an, that's an objective property of things. It yeah. doesn't require that someone... But, it, but in our two rock universe, 10 minus 5 is still 5. Yes. Well, but we I can't don't know. Say, uh, edu educate me because but it's, say, the same, it's the same type of. Does it have any meaning is, to talk about mathematics in a, a two simple, rock universe? Can, can we say that one rock is prettier than the other if no minds exist, or or the rock is valuable, or that a rock is um, beautiful, or um, that a rock makes makes let's see, a rock is inspirational. Or a rock, it doesn't make any sense to talk about objective properties that necessitate a, a subject perceiving that objective property. So you say that, you know, you could have an objective value. I, I, I think those are contradictions in terms. I, I tend to agree with concordance on that, but I, I know um, I, I struggle with that concept, but the caller wants to um, come back. ADT, back to you. Yeah, I do, I do agree with your concordance. So I'll uh, give you that one that, um, yeah, it can't really be objective. But let's just say I'm, I'm not going to talk about the term objective morality anymore. I'm just going to talk about morality. Let's say you just assume that we want to survive, that we want to keep living under those circumstances. They're, they're pretty good circumstances unless the whole human species is going to die. It's practical to have a definition that uh, defines a system of morality that ensures that we live. And if we talk about objective moralities under that assumption, I believe that can be beneficial to society. Good, cool. Yes, yes. And so subjectively, you've decided that subjectively, it's important that species continue or that animals yes. don't experience suffering. Though That's your subjectivity. Uh, and then we can objectively measure I think suffering. You can you can devise tests that objectively measure the presence of suffering, but it requires a subject to perceive that objective property and make a, a value judgment about it to create a moral. And I don't know if that's maybe where Michael and I are disagreeing. Is is I don't think the existence of a thing by itself can ever imbue any kind of value in it, right? Like beauty. You can't have something that's objectively beautiful. You can't have something that's objectively valuable because there has to be someone to value it or, or, or to um, evaluate it or to respond to it in some way. So there's no way for a rock to be inherently or objectively beautiful. But it does have objective qualities. You accepted yes. that. Yeah. Mass, length, weight, height, um, its position in space, its velocity, those are all objective properties because it doesn't matter if someone is there perceiving it. But anytime we talk about values, it is, I think, contradictory to say that there's such a thing as an objective value of any kind. Let's go back to Michael. So, so the burden to actually prove what you're saying though is to, to argue that morality is more like art and aesthetics than it is like what I've been arguing, which is mathematics. So it would help, I think, to lay down some just general rules about um, argumentation theory, basically. When I'm saying that something is objective or that it's um, that can be considered true by definition, then I mean that I cannot possibly imagine it being another way without committing some sort of contradiction. So under your rubric then, like I can imagine someone thinking a Rothko painting is more beautiful than a uh, Da Vinci painting. There's no contradiction. But it's a lot harder for me to imagine that someone believes that genuine suffering is a good thing and is desirable. Because if they actually wanted suffering, then to me, then that, that's not actually suffering. No, we're, they, we're talking about, you know, in the short run, right, versus the long run or uh, the punishment but of criminals. The, 
could be moral or the prevention of further damage. Uh, let's say, you know, our day to day suffering uh, leads to positive yeah, but outcomes. Still... But we can agree that 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 we don't like it. And given our value statements, we can say that it is subjectively wrong. And we can, again, even measure uh, the presence of suffering objectively, but that doesn't really make it an objective moral. No, it's that I can I cannot imagine, like for the life of me, that suffering could be considered a a good thing, and that if someone wanted to suffer, like is it rationally plausible that someone would just one day in the same way that they go out and like go shopping or go for an ice cream cone, say that they want to be tortured for ten years, and say that well, like instead of spending my instead of going to university or maybe like going on vacation, I'd rather be tortured in a dank pit for ever and ever with no gaining no sadistic or sorry masochistic sort of pleasure from it, just pure unadulterated suffering. I cannot imagine that taking place, and it to me. It, like that's the exact same standard of proof that I give to mathematics, where if someone tells me that 10 minus 5 is 8, then I can't imagine that that's how that could possibly be true. Like it I'm seems to, coherent, deeply incoherent. I'm going to go back to a caller um, and then we're going to move on because there are a couple of people uh, stacked up and waiting to come onto the show. Um, ADT. Uh, congratulations on causing such conflict between the members of the panel. Uh, your final words, and then I, I, I say I'm going to move on. Uh, yeah, um, final words. I'll just quickly address Michael. If you find at least one person that enjoys suffering, um, as in true suffering, as in mathematics, you found a contradiction and you disproved whatever theory you're trying to prove. And I believe it's better for us to discuss a practical version of objective morality, where we can come up with some model that benefits human society than talking about some sort of single objective morality for the universe. Thank you. Thank you very much, ADT. Michael, do feel free to respond, and then I'm going to go back to concordance as I bring in the next caller. Okay, well, that's that's pretty clear, and um, our models flow from our theory, so theory is <laughs> Concordance. You may want to unmute your mic. Although he's gone very static, have we lost concordance? 